You're watching All About Money on HKIBC. I'm Isabel Wong. Well, Hong Kong's stock exchange just had the quietest first quarter in a decade. In the first three months of the year, the total equity market funds fell 66 percent, and the total amount raised in initial public offerings on Hong Kong's main board and the growth enterprise market fell 11.6 percent to 2.8 billion U.S. dollars. While Nasdaq is set to dethrone Hong Kong as the world's leading IPO market, Hong Kong exchanges and clearing chief executive Charles Lee said he's not worried. Being number one is what you try to be, you want it to be. It cannot be a goal because uh, every market is different, timing is different. This is a marathon. So, you know, sometimes we lead, sometimes we follow, sometimes we run together. I'm not worried about it at all. We want to maintain those standards. Regulatory regime need to be stable. And we can't really just keep on changing and messing around with it just simply because we want to do more deals. Let's bring in Joe Wen, Triker, Hong Kong CEO. Joe, thank you very much for your time today. So now we just heard from Charles Lee. He's not really worried about Hong Kong losing its status as the world's top IPO market. But he also said he's not planning to relax any sort of regulations in terms of attracting firms to list in Hong Kong. So can you tell us um, from the IPO market's perspective, what does this mean? And what does this mean to the IPO market landscape uh, in this part of the world, like in the uh, so thank you, Isabel. Um, I think uh, Charles did the right thing of not relaxing regulations because having a sound regulatory framework has always been Hong Kong's uh, 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 I guess best reputation. And having that sound regulatory base is what made Hong Kong IPO market attractive in the first place. And I think the biggest gainers from this, what Charles has said, will be the Hong Kong investors. But having said that, you're right, the uh, Hong Kong first quarter IPO market has been, has been slow compared to what we used to be in the last 10 years. Uh, but we do see the activities coming up again. So uh, although we still for, don't foresee Hong Kong to be the top of the IPO market in 2019, we do expect it still remain in the top three or top four, top five. Right. So, um, yeah, at the moment, it's it's around like top three or four, like some would say. But then um, barely a year ago, actually, Hong Kong exchanges, they relaxed a little bit of the regulations in terms of um, firms to be listed um, on the main board. But but still, some China's tech giants, they're still asking Hong Kong exchanges to relax the regulations in terms of um, having um, super voting rights, as well as letting key shareholders to buy stocks from the IPO as well. So do you think Hong Kong actually has the flexibility of offering all these to answer to um, those firms' calls? Uh, I think there will be a, a lot of uh, media attention on the uh, voting rights, super voting rights, or, or as you have said, the new, re the new regulations since last year. I think that's the way to go in the future. Uh, Hong Kong has to adapt to the, uh, the tech market where controlling shareholders own a less than majority of the equity ownership, but they own to control the, uh, the voting rights. And I think Hong Kong is heading in the right direction in that respect. So, yeah, to your question, Hong Kong is flexible enough. We do have the, uh, the framework, the regulatory framework, and the people and the capital markets infrastructure to remain successful. So in terms of uh, mega IPOs, Hong Kong exchanges missed out on one recently. It was when the Chinese tech giant Alibaba decided to list in New York instead of Hong Kong. So in terms of this uh, attracting mega IPOs, what other pressure is Hong Kong exchanges facing at the moment? Uh, I think the stock exchange is also facing a lot of other pressures from other stock exchanges around the world, uh, in particular the US and in China. But however, Hong Kong has still been the number one go-to spot for China-based tech super giants. We have Tencent, we have a long list of uh, super mega IPOs here in Hong Kong. So in the near term or in the longer term, I do feel that Hong Kong still will be the leading runner in this market. Mm -hmm. So um, last year, one of the most notable um, IPOs was the, uh, Xiaomi. Yeah. Xiaomi decided to list um, in Hong Kong. So do you see more of these happening in tw 2019, given all the risks, such as uh, risks coming from the U.S.-China trade war? Do you see more Chinese firms listing in Hong Kong this year? Sure. So uh, China firms account for more than half of our IPOs for the past decade. I don't think I see this trend continue to, uh, uh, to remain as the main trend going forward uh, in terms of tech supergiants or new economy. Last year, I think more than half of the IPO was new economy, be it AI, be it whatever. And this year, uh, in the pipeline, we still do see a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, I guess, tech uh, companies that are planning to list in Hong Kong. Whether it's mega or, or, or super mega, depends on how market is. Right. And then in, in terms of tech firms, um, Charles Lee today, um, he came out and said, um, this week he came out and said, well, um, they are not looking into acquiring um, any tech firms at the moment, but in the near future, they'll be looking into that option internationally or even um, Chinese tech firms. So in terms of Hong Kong exchanges um, acquiring tech firms, like what does, this, what does this mean to the IPO landscape in this part of the world? I think acquiring tech companies is a growing trend not only for the stock exchange, even for companies like ourselves. Uh, we, do acquire, we do look into acquiring companies in the technology sector. And hence, uh, it's, it's where the future is going, be it AI or automation, and that's very important. And, and as you see, those companies that are providing these kind of services, uh, they will come to Hong Kong for an IPO when, they, when the time is suitable for them. Mm -hmm. And specifically, um, do, can you name some of the products maybe that could, that could um, happen in the near future? Do you see any like blockchain-based um, trading or like even cryptocurrencies? Uh, good question. Uh, these cryptocurrencies or blockchain companies, they feel they're still very in the startup mode or startup stage of their uh, corporate cycle. Uh, I don't see a lot of uh, opportunities for them with these companies in, in this coming year. But who knows? Three, five years from now, <laughs> it'll be all blockchain or cryptos. We, we just don't know. It will be interesting to see how. Exactly. But then for, for this year, first half of the of the year, some of the risks that are still remaining, obviously, U.S.-China trade war, yes. Brexit, that maybe Hong Kong is not so exposed to that part right. um, as well. But then, so. U.S.-China trade war is still a huge risk to many investors and firms here in this part of the, of the world. So do you see, um, what kind of impact did you see U.S.-China trade war had on the IPO market in this part of the world? Yeah, the trade war impact definitely was felt in the first quarter of this year. Year on year, it was 40% down, as you said earlier in the program. But now we start to see a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the uh, U.S.-China trade war. And with the Fed declaring effectively not raising interest rates this year, the market is having a U-turn. And uh, so the first half of the year, although altogether will be slower than last year, uh, we do see more activities coming out uh, in the second quarter of this year. Did you see any slowing in terms of activities, such as maybe tech firms and logistics firms might be um, like hit by U.S.-China trade war? Did you see any slowdown in terms of um, activities in that sector? Uh, yes, they, uh, the, 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 what we have seen in the pipeline with more on the tech companies, uh, less so on the logistics or, or, or the manufacturing companies were affected. Uh, those companies, especially those that are uh, focused on the U.S. market, they'll be heavily hit. But having said that, uh, the companies are very agile. They, 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 they will get around the, uh, the trade war uh, in a healthy shape, and they'll come back again when the time is suitable. So in, in this year, with all the risks and uncertainties still at play at the moment, where are the opportunities and what are the risks that you are still worried about? Uh, let's first start with opportunities. Uh, Charles Lee and the Stock Exchange uh, unveiled their three-year plan not too long ago. And in there, it was all summarized in six words, China anchored, globally connected, and technology enabled. So we do see a lot more uh, global companies coming to Hong Kong, uh, speaking to the relevant people, like Stock Exchange, investment bankers. There's a healthy pipeline, uh, in particular, the, uh, the biotech industry that are looking to come to Hong Kong. Uh, so that's the where opportunity lies. And of course, the risk. Uh, Again, you're absolutely right. The trade war it might it now seems to be a, uh, turning back to a more cordial relationship. But who knows? Uh, if that comes again, the market will definitely react. Right, so recently the Hong Kong SFC, they actually slapped a record fine on um, a bunch of investment banks in terms of their handling of uh, IPOs here in Hong Kong. So what does this mean to um, firms that are looking to list in Hong Kong? Does it have any indication or any messages for those firms? Uh, I think the biggest beneficiaries of these fines will be the investors. Now they can rely on the sponsors or the regulator to be more uh, cautious in letting really healthy companies to list in Hong Kong. However, uh, to answer your question, uh, the, the big investment banks has, has changed a lot. Uh, the, the fines were related to uh, failed IPOs, I guess, that was quite a few years back. And all these years together, all these years since happening, the investment banks in, in, has invested in their capital control. Uh, so internal controls, the risk and regulatory framework. So 
Uh, I don't see if big firms uh, having big, any sort of a problem uh, because of these fines. Right, so in terms of the impact, you wouldn't really have any anything significant, right? Unless they do something wrong again. Right, yeah. hold that thought, Joe. We'll be coming back to this conversation later. Joe will be staying with us, but still to come on the program. Chief Executive Karen Lam visited Japan to promote the Great Bay Area this week. What kind of new opportunities are there? Do stay tuned. Welcome back to the second half of All About Money. Chief Executive Carrie Lam met Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in Tokyo this week to promote the Greater Bay Area project. Lam said she hoped to enhance cooperation with Japan to tackle common issues, including aging population, while it's time to take Hong Kong's economy to a new level. Well, still with us is Joe Wan, Triker Hong Kong CEO. Joe, one remaining question I have regarding to the Hong Kong IPO market I have uh, from the first half of the program is that, you know, in Hong Kong, retail investors, they take up about 25% of the total investors here in the IPO market. But as opposed to the U.S. IPO market, retail investors are only 5% of them. So it means there's a significant presence of retail investors in Hong Kong in this city. So in terms of striking a balance between um, attracting retail investors and institutional investors, like which part do you think is more important for firms? Uh, yeah, so Hong Kong people grew up love to trade stocks, and I guess that's the, uh, in their DNA. Uh, short uh, retail investors tend to be a little bit less longer term. They do be little short term traders, uh, but they do provide a, a very significant piece of liquidity to the market to make it efficient. Whereas institutional investors, they tend to be longer term. They have a mandate to invest in God, who knows how many years. So I guess it's it's always a balance of uh, how many of your share of the base to retail and how many to be institutional. Without any retail investors, your stock couldn't be really hot in the Hong Kong market sense. So I guess it really depends on the firm's, uh, I guess the company's objectives on where to have a, a stable base or to be a more a, a volatile, more retail base. It really depends on that company. Right, so it's a, a case, on a case-by-case -case basis. But this week, um, we will shift the focus to the Great Bay Area Initiative because this week we saw um, Carrie Lam, chief executive, she actually visited Tokyo to uh, meet um, Shinzo Abe, Japanese prime minister. So um, she she has one she had one purpose there, promoting the Greater Bay Area project. And it's quite interesting to me because like I, it makes me wonder what kind of role can Japan play in the Greater Bay Area, and what kind of new opportunities can it bring if Japan decides to play a role in this initiative? Yes, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, Carrie Lam meeting Shinzo over the weekend. Uh, Japan has always been uh, very uh, invest a lot of money in the in, in the Greater Bay Area. A lot of their manufacturing will be in in this area, so there already is a big player in the Greater Bay Area. And uh, with the new initiative, or I guess a new blueprint coming up, I guess uh, Japan and Hong Kong are together with in particular Hong Kong people. They love Japan products, uh, the electronics, uh, the, the calculators, whatever. They are all usually made in the GBA. So I guess that's how the, uh, how the connection with Japan and the GBA comes in. So now that you just mentioned um, Japan could possibly play a big role in the Greater Bay Area Development Project, so where do you see opportunities in terms of investment? Uh, companies in Japan uh, seeking expansion in China faces uh, uh, issues that many companies face, which is the language problem or the language barrier. And at Tricor, 70% uh, of our 200 staff in Japan, they're indeed bilingual. Uh, helping Chinese companies uh, to, to tackle the Japanese market and the vice versa when Japanese firm comes in on the China market. We do see a lot of expansion opportunities in the GBA. And for example, and I just said to you earlier, 70% of our workforce still uh, in Japan is bilingual and we, uh, we continue to invest in those talents uh, to serve those companies in the GBA. Right. So in terms of uh, investment opportunities, one of the worries that people have about the Greater Bay Area project is that capital outflow. Because um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, Hong Kong enabled um, northbound bond connect with the Chinese market. But um, recently, we heard from Hong Kong Exchange's chief executive, Charles Lee, he said that there wouldn't, um, the southbound bond connect would not be happening anytime soon. So. In, in a sense, there's a delay in terms of uh, the southbound bond connect. Yes. So do you think it will actually worsen the worries people have about the Greater Bay Area, about capital outflow from the city? 
Uh, I don't see that as a, as a problem. Uh, Southbound Connect, it will be delayed. It won't happen. It was not likely to happen in 2019. But the GPA itself presents a wealth of opportunities. For example, in the blueprint, uh, Hong Kong will be the capital market capital. Uh, Macau will be the uh, leisure, uh, you know, holiday uh, city. And Shenzhou will be innovation hub. So by itself, there are lots of opportunities for us to invest in. So the delay on the bond market or the, on, the, on the bond connect doesn't really worry me that much in that sense. Yeah. Right. So um, um, this year, in the first half of the year, obviously the central government, they released the blueprint for the Greater Bay Area project. So d in your view, did you see any projects or any sort of developments being sped up because of the blueprint release? And what, what are some of the development projects that you are watching that you are optimistic about? So, uh, as, as I said earlier, GBA is, is, is a huge opportunity, and Trico uh, already have a presence in the key cities in the GBA area. However, with this new blueprint uh, and, and the new initiative and the policies that comes with the blueprint in the near future, we do a lot more demand in our services. Trico is very uh, good at helping businesses expand, and with that, we need technology and we need a lot of people. Uh, talented people. So Trico will continue to invest in technology, in particular in the in Shenzhen, uh, or in the Guangzhou area. However, I do see more competition now for, for talented people. Uh, it's a scary, scarce resource. Right. So firms have really got to think of ways to attract talent. Huh? So um, you, you just mentioned you, um, your firm has some significant presence in the Great Bay Area cities. So who are your clients, and, and what do they? What kind of services are they most um, interested in from you guys? So Trico uh, services globally. Uh, Eighty percent of our revenue will be in business services, in in particular accounting, tax, and payroll, and then. Uh, and, and in particular, this corporate secretarial services that we provide uh, that makes up 80% of our business globally. Uh, and in, in the Grady Bay area, we continue to play our strongest cards in the accounting, tax, payroll space. And when the new companies come in, the MNCs, they tend not to have a lot of people on the ground. Uh, they tend not to have accountants on the ground. That's where we can help. Right. You just mentioned um, firms, they might have to think of ways to attract talent because um, it's becoming more competitive. Yes. But in terms of competition between the Greater Bay Area cities, do you see this being a real risk? Uh, I think the GBA blueprint, the beauty of it was it, it categorized cities into particular industries. Hmm. For example, Macau will be entertainment, Hong Kong will be the, you know, the capital markets and China will be innovation. So I don't see a lot of competition between cities uh, directly in that sense. But again, as I mentioned, the, the competition for talent will intensify. Right. And do you see any um, Greater Bay Area based um, companies looking to file IPOs in Hong Kong? Like, do they see the attraction of filing in Hong Kong or do you think they would still be looking elsewhere? I think uh, uh, Hong Kong or the United States will still be two of the key markets they look at. Uh, Hong Kong is still preferable. Uh, as I said earlier in the program, uh, last year, 50% of our IPO comes from Chinese companies. It's because of affinity, because of language, because of, of the geographical proximity. I think Hong Kong will still be the number one choice. Uh, but we do have a lot of our uh, I guess, uh, uh, developments to do uh, to continue to hold on to that number one. So in terms of attracting these firms to list in Hong Kong, like what, what else is Hong Kong missing in order to not lose any more mega IPOs to, say, New York or other markets? I think uh, WVR, Weighted Voting Rights, will be, a, will be a big step for Hong Kong. Uh, otherwise, Hong Kong is, we have been number one for so many years. And this year, we, we went from number one to number three, which is still very good. So I guess Hong Kong, once we get the, uh, the WVR right, uh, when the market picks up again, we'll regain that spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in the first half of the program, we talked a little bit about um, the U.S.-China trade war, the risks there. But then I would like to talk about the risks, um, what, what it did to the Great Bay Area, because with uncertainties in the manufacturing sector, also logistics and tech mm -hmm. sectors, like... Do you still see any um, opportunities in the Great Bay Area this year? Like, where would you put your money in? Uh, it's still going to be GBA area. Right. Uh, the opportunities are just too fast. Uh, but uh, to your point on the on the on the trade war, uh, since since the trade war began, we do see a lot of manufacturing companies shifting their bases from China to countries like Vietnam or Thailand, which is not in the not in the middle of the trade war. Uh, so manufacturing may be not the best time to invest in right now, uh, but technology, innovation. Uh, Shenzhen makes the most of the world drones in the world. 
So that, that continued to be a, an area of focus for, me, for ourselves. But um, did you see, um, because uh, of the risks coming from the U.S.-China trade war, did you see any of these firms, they were discouraged from filing any IPOs this year? I think they were more cautious. Uh, they were more cautious in filing at the right time. These companies are still very healthy. They enlist any time in terms of you know, fulfilling the requirements. Uh, but these firms have been more cautious. Some of them we do see pulled back the schedule or even withdraw from the schedule and wait for things to clarify. Yeah, and then um, we've also heard um, words about any potential IPOs. Like, do, are there any IPOs that you're really looking forward to for 2019? Uh, we look for all the. As striker, we look forward to all the IPOs <laughs> because of uh, you know, statistics in the first quarter of this year, there were 37 IPOs in Hong Kong, and Trico served 45 percent of the 37 companies. So we do look forward to all of these IPOs. Uh, be it a, a Chinese-based company or multinational company, as long as it's come to us, we'll serve them well. Any, particularly, uh, any particular uh, sector that you are mostly optimistic about? Uh, I would bet on, bet on the biotech right. industry. Mm -hmm. I think it will, be a, it will be a main driver of 2019's uh, IPOs. Yeah, and then um, also in terms of financial activities in the Greater Bay Area, mm -hmm. uh, recently we saw um, there were some policy changes in the Greater Bay Area cities because now that um, Hong Kong residents, they are allowed to open a, ba a bank account in the yeah. Greater Bay Area, they are allowed to hold a renminbi bank account. So do you see this potentially becoming like a game changer for Hong Kong investors? Yeah, as I referred earlier, the, the competition for talents was very, very intense. And I think the, uh, the uh, PRC government made a right choice of slightly tweaking that policy and to make it more favorable for Hong Kong citizens to work in China. Hence, uh, that will only, uh, I guess, make it more attractive for Hong Kong people to develop their career in the Greater Bay Area. So what kind of investment activities do you foresee Hong Kong people will be doing more in the Greater Bay Area cities? It's still it's the tech, the biotech, uh, the, the traditional industries, manufacturing, they'll still continue to be strong. So any sort of, um, say, um, buying property or um, in, in, uh, in terms of uh, starting businesses, do you think these activities will also become easier for Hong Kong residents? Definitely, since, definitely, right. definitely. Uh, the, especially for, for young Hong Kong people to start the business, it's much more efficient and access to talent pools will be easier in Shenzhen or, or Guangzhou even. However, in terms of property, uh, it's a different matter that the, the prices may be too high, you know, yeah. there's in policies. So, yeah. So Hong Kong is definitely um, developing itself to become like a tech hub. But then, meanwhile, the Greater Bay Area cities, they are all trying to be tech hubs. So now that we have this bank account favorable policy, and, and you just said millennials, they would be going to start their own businesses in the Greater Bay Area cities um, in the mainland China. Do you see this being like a potential competition for Hong Kong's status as a tech hub? Hong Kong's status as a tech hub uh, is not as strong as Hong Kong's status as a financial market center. And that, uh, I think, it was still a very solid position. Uh, in terms of a tech hub or attracting tech people, tech talents, Hong Kong has a lot of catching up to do. Right. And then uh, what other catching up um, does Hong Kong will have to do in, in order to have stronger performance among the Greater Bay Area cities? I think Hong Kong's, uh, how Hong Kong is different from the other 10 cities in the Greater Bay Area is we have a very solid one country, two systems uh, system, I guess, in, from the government. Uh, the rule of law and the efficiency of capital market is still something that the other cities don't have. And Hong Kong has to make sure that the core value of these uh, rule of law, uh, capital markets has to be, has to be further uh, maintained. Uh, in terms of development, uh, we, we all hope to see pricing, uh, housing prices to come down a little bit to be more affordable. Otherwise, Hong Kong, uh, albeit com competition with other uh, cities, uh, I think Hong Kong is still the front runner. Joe, thank you very much for your time today. Thank that you. was Joe Wan Triker, Hong Kong CEO. This is it from this edition of All About Money. We'll be back right here on HKIBC next Sunday. Good night.